All right, I'm live. Hello. Well, welcome, everybody. Glory to God. Well, good to see all of you and uh, you, you sprinkling that are here with us tonight. But glory to God. That's wonderful. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, we had a good day today. How the Lord's blessed us and uh, everything's wonderful. And, and uh, the Lord's king of heaven and earth. And we're going to get in here and see if we can kind of get some of Revelation taken care of. Uh, we looked last week at uh, at a kind of a rundown, really, is what I'm thinking it was. Um, I started somehow, I got started back where um, everything started at the beginning, and then I just kept kind of dragging around and pretty much lined out for the whole time the, the, the description of everything and kind of just rehearsed back through everything that has gone on before. So hopefully that's helpful, and I don't know why I might have been doing that. But anyway, um, let's go on to chapter, yeah, let's go on to chapter 12 and 13, because that's all right, brother. Yeah, chapter 12 and 13 are basically answer two big questions for us. And the two big questions uh, are, how is this, uh, this great tribulation? You know, we talked about the fact that in, in the book of Revelation, uh, the Lord reveals to us that they're going to be that there's a seven-year period that's called the tribulation period, and in that seven-year period there are two distinct three and a half-year periods of time, and in the three and a half-year periods of time, the first three and a half years is just identified by the word the tribulation, and then the second three and a half years, the last three and a half years is called the great tribulation. To distinguish it because the Lord says that at that point that tribulation is going to be greater than the world has ever seen and it is a time where um, the Antichrist just basically reveals himself for who he is and lays down all pretense of trying to of deceiving Israel and being their friend and um, uh, seducing them to believe in him and trust him and have confidence in him, which they, by the middle of the tribulation period, Israel does believe that the Antichrist is their friend. They're, they're deceived by him. And he's done everything in order to curry their favor. He's uh, uh, basically taken over the world and we saw this, and I'm just kind of cruising back before we start reading these verses here in chapter in chapter 12. But he's he's uh, uh, the the trumpets are sounding. The trumpets in chapters eight and nine. You remember the tr first trumpet sounds, and hail and fire start falling on the earth and mingled with blood. And then uh, the second thing is the meteor falls into the sea, and a third of the sea turns to blood, and a third of the ships are destroyed, and so forth. And then the third trumpet sounds, and this 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 bitter meteor from heaven called wormwood falls and hits all the fresh water, and so it's all the fresh water is now bitter, and people die because of uh, some kind of uh, water shortage and all that kind of stuff that goes with it. And then uh, the fourth trumpet sounds and a third of the moon, a third of the sun, and a third of the stars are blackened out. And they don't shine. And then the fifth trumpet blows and uh, a star falls from heaven uh, that with the keys to the abyss and, the, and, and he opens the abyss and he opens it up and all these demon locusts fly out that uh, are pretty much described and, and by what we see like, an, like Apache helicopters with a fire that shoots out of their tails and fires that move, shoot out of their mouth and faces like men. And uh, they're described as basically terrorizing the earth and attacking some city, maybe a city in Turkey as an example, but some major city that is uh, part of a northern confederacy that's probably made up of nations like Turkey and some of the Russian empires. Uh, and that starts World War III. And then the sixth trumpet blows his horn. And the world war starts where the, uh, where the kings of the north are drawn down to tr attack Israel. And then they come up from the south and Africa and Libya and Egypt and so forth. And then from the east and the west. And, and it seems like they're all you know, coming in on tiny little Israel, and God miraculously delivers Israel. Uh, it doesn't really tell us 
exactly how, I mean, it's not the Battle of Armageddon where Jesus steps down and kills everything. It's just that God supernaturally keeps them from being annihilated and allows them to win the battle over all the powers of the earth. Now, this is not the kings of the east, which you'll see in the Battle of Armageddon. The kings of the east are China and India and um, Japan. Those are considered the Far East nowadays. If you, if you, when, when the world is described nowadays, the Euphrates River is kind of the separation between the East, which is like Iran and Iraq, and uh, some of the northern part would be some of the Russian, like the new Russian states that are, uh, that are up there that used to be a part of the Soviet Union. But it stops at the Euphrates River, which is the old city of Babylon, which is Baghdad, and, and it stops there, and then this is called the East. But when it, calls, when it says the, the Far East, then it's talking about across the Euphrates River, which is India and China and Japan. The Orient is what we would call it. Now, in the Battle of Armageddon, it is the Far East that is going to come across the dried up Euphrates River and come in to attack uh, the Antichrist initially uh, to attack the Antichrist to, to make war with him, but ultimately they're going to be fighting against God and, the, and, the, and, the, and Israel and the people of God. It's almost like, okay, the kings of the Far East have had enough of this mess, and they basically say, we're, not, we're, we're tired of this Antichrist. We're not going to submit to him anymore. He thinks he's going to rule the world. He's not going to rule the world, and that's going to be their motivation to come and fight against the Antichrist in his kingdom. But he's going to turn it around so that basically they end up trying to fight against God's people in Israel and Jerusalem. And, of course, then Jesus comes down, sets his feet on the mountains. It splits. The valley of Megiddo becomes Armageddon, and the blood runs as deep as horses' bridles and so forth. So it's a very subtle deception caused by the Antichrist. But the thing that marks the change from a normal three-and-a-half-year period where, where Satan basically sets up this leader that uh, by subtlety and craft and deception takes over the world, not by war, not by power, uh, not by some military means, yeah, but he does it by sleight of hand and deception, by lying and deceit, by subtlety and craft. You know, he, he, he gains control. And we, and we know this because the rider of the white horse, which was the first seal, this rider came out on the white horse, and he looked like a king. He looked just like Jesus is described when he comes on the white horse in, in, the, in, the, in the latter part of Revelation, and Jesus had a crown on, and it was a diadem. The, Antichrist, the first rider of the, of the white horse in the, when the first seal is broken also has a crown on, but it's not a diadem. It's not the crown of a king. It's, a, it's an earthly crown. It's like the crown of the laurel wreath, like an Olympic champion would wear. And so this, in other words, the, the rider on the white horse is imitating Christ. He's, he, he, he's a pretend, he's a pretend uh, uh, leader of the world. And he has a bow, but he doesn't have any arrows. So in other words, he, this means he takes over the world not by a war, because he doesn't have any arrows, but by subtlety. They, he's, given, he's given control. So the point of that being that the Antichrist for the first three and a half years takes over the world because the world gives him control. They just look at him and say, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to the earth. This is the wisest. This guy's charming. This guy's brilliant. This guy's manipulative. He is just, everybody loves the Antichrist. And they think he's the answer to the world's problems. He's the answer to everything that's bad in the world. And remember, because there is no Holy Spirit here to, to, to hinder the deception and the, and the fraud, and there are no voices like Christian voices to, to stop the world from 
seeing this person as a Messiah and as a leader, uh, he pretty much has free reign to do whatever he wants to do and be as deceptive as he wants to be, and he does, and he, he deceives the world. And he convinces the Jews that he loves them, that they are his people, that he's going to take care of them, which is what the Jewish people have always wanted to happen because the Jewish people have always been persecuted from the very time, the, from the, every world leader, basically, every world leader has tried to exterminate the Jews. And I'll show you a slide in a few minutes. As a matter of fact, let me just see if I can scroll to that and you'll see what I'm talking about. I've got a couple of slides that have them listed. All right, here they are. Every world leader pretty much has tried to exterminate the Jews. Look, that Pharaoh in Moses' day tried to exterminate the Jews. You remember he killed all the Jewish boys that were two years old and under, and he had them enslaved, and then he pursued them to the Red Sea, and he was going to kill all the Jews that were being delivered, but God miraculously opened the sea, let the Jews pass. When he went in the sea, God closed the sea up and killed his armies and so forth. So God miraculously delivered them in Moses' day. Uh, Haman, which was another leader of an empire in Persia, went in, in the book of Esther, Haman was going to exterminate all the Jews and kill all of the Jews. You remember he built the, he built the big uh, hangman stand, and he was going to hang them. And Haman ended up being hanged on the very gallows that he had built for the Jews because of a marvelous re revelation of a plan that God uh, revealed to the king and so forth. But that was an effort to kill all the Jews. Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel's day, you remember Nebuchadnezzar brought all the the, the youth, the wise youth, and put them in a Babylonian training program to become Babylonians and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which are Daniel's three buddies. And Daniel said, we're not going to eat the king's meat and we're not going to fall for the king's plan. And so the king said, if you don't bow down to me, I'm going to throw you in a furnace. And, and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hananiah, Mishael, and Az Azariah, is their Hebrew names, wouldn't bow. And he threw them in, and they didn't burn. And he looked in there and saw them walking around, and he said, how many did we throw in? And the people said, we threw three of them in there. And they said, well, and the king said, well, why is it I see four of them walking around? And one of them looks like the son of man, you know. So Jesus is in there walking around with them in the furnace, and Nebuchadnezzar sees that, and then he gets them out, and they didn't even have the smell of smoke on their clothes. And so then Nebuchadnezzar writes, I think it's the fourth chapter of Daniel, if I'm not just off the top of my head, I think it's the whole fourth chapter of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar writes some of the Bible. I don't know if you know this. So Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, who is an infidel reprobate, writes a whole chapter in the Word of God because Nebuchadnezzar starts extolling the virtues of a God that could be as powerful as that. And Nebuchadnezzar comes to comes to God, I mean, believes and, and, and sets up and says, man, how in the world could anybody not believe in this magnificent, wonderful God? I mean, he, he just starts worshiping God, and his words are written down in chap Daniel chapter 4. And he, and he leaves this message for his son, Belshazzar, and Belshazzar, or some people pronounce it Belshazzar, but Belshazzar becomes the king after Nebuchadnezzar, and Belshazzar, his son, uh, gets drunk, you know, and and has the big, big uh, banquet, and they all get liquored up. And when they get liquored up, they, he thinks about these vessels that are, you know, in the, some uh, back room closet somewhere. And he says, hey, bring out the vessels of that God. It's supposed to be so great. And, I, and then they bring it out there, and he defiles the vessels of God. In other words, he mocks and ridicules the things that are holy, the the artifacts that, that the Jews had with them. And, and he, and he in, in, in essence, he mocks and ridicules God himself. And so God writes, start of, all of a sudden, Belshazzar turns around and he's, you know, liquored up and tanked up and he, and he sees this hand writing on the wall, a finger writing on the wall, mene, mene, tikel, you farson. It's what it puts up there. And of course, he, can't, he doesn't know what that means. And so he, he, he almost passes out. He's full of fear. He's trembling. His knees are knocking. He's just, 
I mean, this is a, like a ghost or something writing on the wall. Something. What does that mean? And all of his soothsayers and astrologers, they don't know what it means either. And, and so just like Joseph in, in, down in Egypt when they had Joseph in prison and, and Pharaoh had the dream of the skinny cows and fat cows and didn't know what it was and couldn't remember the dream and they called for Joseph to come interpret the dream, just like that, same kind of scenario, they said, well, hey, King, we got this boy down there named Daniel, and he's, you know, he's pretty good at, at, uh, at, at calling attention to things, and so uh, we're going, uh, why don't we go get him? We know where he is. And so they go down to the prison, and there's Daniel. They bring Daniel back up there, and Daniel said, I can tell you what that means. And he said, uh, what does it mean? And he said, you really want to know, right? right? <laughs> okay. He says, what that mene, mene, tikel, your farson means is that uh, uh, God has weighed you in the balances and you have been found wanting. Mm -hmm. And he's going to divide your kingdom between the Medes and the Persians. And uh, I believe it was that very night, and I'm sorry I hadn't read the story in a, you know, a few years now, but... but uh, but he divided the king, and sure enough, the Medes and the Persians came in, took over, and that was the end of the Babylonian Empire because of the foolishness of Belshazzar. And how I got on that, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> that was Nebuchadnezzar's boy. But I'm just saying that Nebuchadnezzar tried to destroy the Jews by bringing the smartest, wisest Jews into Babylon captivity and trying to teach them how to be Babylonians and thereby destroy their the Jews by taking the best and the brightest and turning them into uh, Babylonians instead of Jews. And then Darius the Mede, the Medo-Persian Empire, I told you the Medes took over after Babylon fell. And so Darius tried to kill them all. Herod in Jesus' day, the Romans tried to kill all the, all the Jews. Remember they had the Jewish boys that were two years old and under killed because they knew that he knew that Jesus had been born and he said, I'm going to kill, let them kill Jesus. And so he had all the boys, the Jewish boys that were two years old and under killed. And G God had called Jesus away. You remember they, Joseph, he spoke to Joseph and Joseph took his family down into Egypt. And this is kind of an off, off the wall kind of a comment, I guess. But, um, <laughs> I might as well say it. Uh, yeah, I mean, th this is just a thought now, and I'm going to just, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know that this says more than what I'm going to say, but it's not an effort to say more. It's just an observation. But, you know, it's all, there's always discussions about how Jesus looked, and we know that he was Jewish. We know this because, I mean, he was born of a Jewish mama, Mary, and, and God was the father, and so the covenant is with Israel. And, of course, every prophet and every prediction and everything in the book of Revelation, and we'll see it in just a minute, is about a seed that is born from the nation of Israel that's going to crush the head of the serpent. So if you want to know what nationality Jesus was, he was Jewish. He wasn't American. He wasn't European. He wasn't African. He was Jewish. But how did he look? Well, I'm just saying that when God got ready to hide Jesus, he took him to Egypt. Now, what is Egypt? Egypt is African. So when, when Jesus, when, when, they want, when he, God wanted to hide him, he had to, I mean, you wouldn't take him to a nation where he sticks out like a sore thumb. So he looked like an Egyptian. He, in other words, Jesus was very dark. Very, in other words, when you saw Jesus in Egypt, you would think that he was an Egyptian. So I'm just making an observation that, you know, <laughs> Jesus might have been more black toned than he was anything else. He's not, one thing we know, he didn't have blonde hair, blue eyes, and looked like a, you know, <laughs> looked like a movie star, you know, because he was hidden in Egypt, which means to me, you, he has to look like that, or it would have been, you know, uh, hey, did you see that new guy that came to town? <laughs> you know, it'd be like, it'd be, it'd be obvious. It'd be like, and you know, this new guy came to town, and shoot, man, where did he come from? You know, and the, and the authorities would have been alerted right off the bat that these people didn't fit in down here. They obviously are some kind of foreigners, and that's probably who they're looking for up there. 
But, uh, but he fit in, and he was able to be hidden. And, and then when the, when the crisis was over up here, God spoke to Joseph again, and, and, and Joseph took him back up into the land of Nazareth and so forth. So God just miraculously delivered him. But that in Herod's day, that was an attempt. And I'm, I'm just saying to you that every world leader has tried to destroy and exterminate the Jews off of this earth. Canute, and I know you probably never heard that name, but he was a... He was really a king or a, a world leader in England in the year, about a thousand years ago, and he banished all the Jews from England. And then Edward I, Longshanks, if you remember. How many of you, how many of you watched uh, Braveheart? The, the king in, of England in Braveheart was Edward I, which was Longshanks. And remember the Mel Gibson character, the Scots were rebelling against Longshanks. That's what the whole movie was about and so forth. Well, Longshanks uh, drove all the Jews from England in an effort to eliminate them from the world. France and Germany blamed them for the Black Plague uh, that hit the, hit the world. The Jews were the cause of the Black Plague, which we know that obviously wasn't true. <laughs> and, uh, and then Spain drove them out of their kingdom. Uh, that was about the time when Spain drove them out. That was about the time that Columbus sailed to America, if you want to kind of get something in your mind. So 1700s, late 1700s, uh, Spain said, all right, I'm, let's get rid of all the Jews out of Spain. And then Hitler, well, you know, put, well, you know about Hitler, and Hitler tried to kill them all, put them in the concentration camps, put them in gas ovens, uh, a preview of an Antichrist that would come. Let me just say this to you. What the Antichrist is going to do with the Jews will make Hitler look like a Sunday school teacher. But... It's, it's a, it's an, you've seen this before, and, and the Jews have been the most hated, the most hunted, hunted the, the most discriminated against people in the history of the world. People hate the Jews just because they're Jews. As an example, just as an example, we had a report just yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe the day before at the latest, that uh, there were 11 people killed in a Jewish synagogue where, where was that? What city was that? Saturday. In Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, somebody walked into a Jewish synagogue and just started shooting people in there. Yeah, and, and, and he said that he did it just because they're Jews. And I'm thinking, man, what kind of hatred, what kind of, what kind of demonic hatred would, would cause you to just walk in you don't know anybody in there. They didn't do anything against you. And you just indiscriminately just start shooting them because they're, cause they're Jews. Well, I think a lot of this stuff that people do, it's demonic influence. Oh, yeah, absolutely. To do that. Yeah. And and psychologists, psychiatrists, you know, they'll explain, explain it away with them. You know, something right. Else, but I, I think it's actually demonic Trump influence. Is gonna right. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Well, well, let's hope. Yeah, let's let. Yeah, I, I, and they needs a death penalty. If it, if you could have worse than a death penalty, that'd be great. I mean, this is ridiculous. Oh, absolutely. Well, yeah. Let's make it. Let's make it about anything but what it is, and it is just pure unmitigated evil. And now you look at the world, and basically the Russian and the Arab states are the chief persecutors today. I mean, you have states all around Israel, and I'm not trying to make any kind of political statement. I'm just saying what it is, that the Palestinians who, who live right now, I mean, they built a wall to keep Palestine separated from Israel because the Palestinians kept try, just doing little raids in there and blowing stuff up and killing people. And they built a wall because the Palestinians say that we don't even think that Israelis need to be alive on this earth. We, we don't even recognize them as a state, and we think every one of them ought to be dead and pushing up daisies, and we're going to do everything to try to kill them. I mean, just pure just hatred. And then other Arab states, they won't even recognize Israel, Iran, Iraq. They won't recognize Israel as a state. They say, Pfft. We don't care what the United States says and the rest of the world. We don't think you need, we don't recognize you as a state or your right to be here, and we're going to kill you as, as we possibly can. So it's just the same spirit. Yeah. Yeah, he was the guy in Pittsburgh. Was, 
yeah, was shouting those kind of things while he was, you know. And, uh, and, and I'm just saying, what I'm saying to you is the book of Revelation is about that kind of spirit being alive in the last days. One of the things that I think the Bible means when it says you will be blessed if you read this book and you understand what's written and you live by the things that are written in this book. Remember, I said the first, at the fir in the first chapter of Revelation, it says that. There's a verse that says you will be blessed if you read this, if you understand it, and then if you follow it. And then in the last chapter, Another verse at the end says, if you read this, if you understand this, and you follow this, you will be blessed. I think one of the ways you will be blessed is if you are a Jew and you see this, it's going to help you stay alive because you're going to know what to do and you're going to see what to do. And when you see these things begin to happen, you'll know what's going to happen next. And so understand this and you won't be deceived and you won't be sucked in and you won't be drawn in and you won't be vulnerable to this deception. And you'll know as soon as you see these things begin to happen that you need to head for the hills, man. You need to you get you need to get off the grid. You need to turn your cell phone in and not have a computer with you and not have any tracking device with you because they're going to come after you, you know. Uh, yes, yes. Hundred forty four thousand. Mm -hmm. I got that too. All right. Where in it does it say that Trump is gonna build a temple on the Wayland Wall? Yeah. It, it it'll it, we're just about to get into that. We sure are. Like chapter fourteen, fifteen. Right now, all right, j just we'll jump in here right now on these verses and get get them moving forward to you. But what Lawrence asked is, uh, where does the Bible talk about a temple being built in the last days where uh, it, it is the Wailing Wall? The Wailing Wall is the, is, the, is the underground wall of Solomon's temple. Solomon, King David's son, built a temple in Jerusalem. Remember, David wanted to build the kingdom. I mean, wanted to build the temple when he brought the ark back, he wanted to build a temple, but God didn't let him build a temple. And he told him that his son would build the temple, and Solomon is David's son, and Solomon built the temple. And then in 70 AD, you remember Jesus was looking at the city of, uh, of Jerusalem, and he began to weep before he rode in on the donkey, and they waved the palm branches. Jesus was looking and weeping, and he was lamenting and said, Oh, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you like a chick, like a mother chicken does under her wings, but you wouldn't come under here and under my protection. And, and, and the time is coming when you will be destroyed and not one stone will be left upon another. Well, when did that happen? It happened in 70 AD, about 30 years, roughly 35 years after Jesus was crucified on this earth. Titus, the Roman general, rode into the city of Jerusalem and destroyed the city of Jerusalem and not one stone was left upon another and he sowed and he plowed the ground with plows and sowed salt on the ground so that it couldn't grow anything. And the only reason the Wailing Wall is still there is because it was underground, because it was the foundation of the temple. And, and that was it. All of the temple that was built on top of the foundation was destroyed and not one stone was left on another. And the Wailing Wall, they dug out where the Wailing Wall was so they could walk up. And if you see a picture of it now, the Wailing Wall is basically the foundation that was below ground level. And they, and they go there and they put little prayers in the wall and they worship at the wall because they're worshiping where the original temple was. Well, of course, the Antichrist, in an effort to convince Israel that he's their friend, is going to give them control of the property that now belongs to the, to the, to the Arabs, to the, to the Muslim people. The Muslim people built a temple called the Mosque of Omar, right on the temple site where Solomon's temple was because to the 
Muslim faith, that spot is holy also. It's sacred. It's a sacred spot in their religion because it has to do with Abraham and it has to do with uh, the giving of this land and the recapturing of this land after the Romans got it and so forth. And so the Muslim thinks, the Muslim people think, this is our holy site. This is our holy place. This, is, this place is holy to us. And right now, as I'm speaking to you, the Mosque of Omar is sitting on that site where the Muslims come every day and worship their deity and so forth. So the Antichrist is going to take this spot away from the Muslims, the Arabs, because in the war that happened, the World War III, remember this, when the sixth trumpet blows and the northern confederacy comes down and the eastern people from the Euphrates River, which includes Iran, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia, and these countries, these Arab countries, and then Libya and Ethiopia and all these countries from the south, and then these countries like Turkey and Russia, some of the Russians, when they all begin to come against tiny Israel when the sixth trumpet blows and God miraculously delivers Israel, uh, the Antichrist is going to be looked at as the greatest general that's ever lived in the world. And the Arab people, are, he's going to say, sorry, you, can't, you rebelled against me. You came to fight and all that, and you lost, so uh, I'm taking this stuff away from you. And the Jews are going to go, thank God, finally, somebody loves us. Somebody's powerful enough to take the property away from these uh, Arabs and these Muslims. And he's going to look at the Jews and say, here, this is your property. It's holy and sacred to you. So here, you take it. And he's going to give them the property and he's going to give them authority to do whatever they want to do with the property. Not only are they going to have it, they're going to have the right now to do whatever they want to. And they're going to tear down the mosque of Omar and they're going to build the temple. They're going to build Solomon's temple on that site. And when they get it ready, then the, before they sacrifice the first offering on the altar of this brand new temple, and I know this may sound a little bizarre, but this is what has to happen. There is a ceremony that always happened when Israel needed to start a new sacrifice in a new place where they were led uh, in the wilderness, in the, in the tabernacle in the wilderness, that became the temple when, when they got permanently in the land. In, when they were traveling, when Moses came out of Egypt and led them out, and you know, for the 40 years that they were in the wilderness, a temporary structure went with them where they set it up just like God drew it up, and it was built to certain specifications. It was called the tabernacle. And they set it up, and the tabernacle was just a temporary uh, temple where the Holy of Holies and the holy place and then the court of the people were built, and the people would come in one time a year and sacrifice on the brazen altar outside, and the priest would take the blood and go in and, and, and sprinkle the blood on the, cher on the cherubim angels' wings that, that sat on the top of, of the Ark of the Covenant, and God forgave the sins. It was called the Day of Atonement. It happened one time a year, and, God, and, 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 and that blood that was sacrificed put off judgment. It didn't, it didn't permanently erase judgment. It just postponed judgment for the next year. Next year, you had to come back and do the same thing. Next year, you had to come back and do the same thing. Every year, once a year, the Day of Atonement. Well, when they got into the Promised Land, they built a permanent temple that replaced the tabernacle, and this was Solomon's temple. This was the original temple built when they came into the land to replace the tabernacle, and there was a ceremony that they had to do every year once they wanted to start to worship again. They had the ashes of the red heifer. And a heifer is a little female cow. You might remember this, a little feminine calf. And there was one that was sacrificed originally. And every year, or and every time the tabernacle moved, they had to move the ashes of the one that was sacrificed before, take those ashes with them, 
And the next year, before they could start making a sacrifice, they had to, they had to ceremonially sprinkle these ashes from the previous one to make this one holy, to sanctify it. So what I'm just saying to you is before the Jews can worship in this brand new temple that they're going to build on the original site of Solomon's temple, they're going to have to take the ashes of the red heifer that got sacrificed back in about 70 AD. Uh, somebody's got them. Somebody's got them right now. And so those are going to have to be sprinkled on that altar to make that reestablishment of that sacrificial system okay and right. So they're going to sprinkle the ashes of the red heifer and get it ready to, for the first, first worship service, and all of a sudden the back door is going to blow open and the Antichrist is going to stand back there, and he's going to have a swine. He's called, Jesus said, the, the abomination of, that causes desolation. Daniel, the prophet Daniel said, and the abomination of desolation will violate the altar by coming in and setting himself up as God, as if he were God, convincing himself that he is God. And he's going to bring a pig with him. And he's going to put it on the altar. And he's going to sacrifice this pig on the altar. And of course, when the Jewish people see this, it's, uh-oh, this sucker's turned on us. We better run for the hills and he begins to chase them and persecute them and kill them and begin to exterminate them. And they run for their lives as fast as they can. And this is what's being described in chapter 12 and 13. This is how the, the tribulation starts. This is how the persecution starts. This is what happens. And, and so two, two big questions are answered in chapter 12 and 13. One is... How is this great tribulation brought about? And then how is the Antichrist power set up? So it, that's what it's talking about in chapters, 12, uh, uh, in chapters uh, 12 and 13. So let's just read these real quick, okay? Say one more thing. Yeah, I yeah, you got it. When they start talking about building, the, building, building the mosques there, mm -hmm. right. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. When it right, when it when it I mean think about this now and I mean think about the environment of the world we're living in. I mean think about this. Right now, seriously. And I I mean this is not this is not a a, a nationality deal. This is not a personality deal. It, it's just a fact. I mean the world we're living in right now favors Muslim people. Why? I have no idea. Because the, the radicals of, of that religion have overtaken the religion. I mean, they, they just, they've just blown it open so that the world is suspicious of this religion. But somehow, in spite of that fact, they are favored in this world. Now, how, how crazy is that? that these people have demonstrated hatred, violence, and bitterness, and prejudice toward a whole group of people and have no qualms about killing these people. And, and right, I mean, it's, yeah, it's just like Lawrence, it's, all, it's just black and white, man. It's not, I mean, it's not even any question. And yet the media and the press and whatever loves them. And it's like, how can you love them? They're violent and evil and wicked, but they love them. And they get mad at anybody who speaks negative about them. I mean, what I'm saying right now could probably get us kicked off Facebook, I guarantee you. If Facebook heard this, they'd probably say, boop, that's violent, boop, he's got to go, you know. And how, right, I mean, fake, yeah, how, how ridiculous is that? And see, what I'm just saying is, that is the spirit of the age that we live in. That is total delusion. That is total deception. It's ridiculous. It's, it's demonic. It's delusional. And guess who's persecuted? Anybody who speaks stuff like I'm saying right now. If anybody, nobody would be able to say this on any national platform without everybody. The Twitter universe would light up with how de evil and deceptive and how I'm speaking hate speak and blah, blah, blah. 
It's ludicrous. It's, it's delusional. But, and, yeah. Everybody. Mm. Right, and always have. Always have. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly right. And see, and, and what... Right, and what I'm saying is, yeah, just like you guys are describing. Right, why? Right, why would? Right, why would everybody? Right, why would everybody not be against that? Why would anybody think that's okay? This is wonderful, and we need to protect this. And anybody that speaks against it, we need to be. We need to be. We need to come against them and destroy them. And uh, I mean, it's just delusional. It's just. And and I'm just saying, the Book of Revelation says the spirit of the age is what is doing this. There's no reasonable explanation. There's no rational explanation why the world would treat this. Thing as as though it's okay, and anybody that speaks against it as if they're the ones that are wicked and evil. And I'm just saying there's no other way to explain it other than demonic delusion. And that's what chapter 12 is about, and chapter 13 is about. How does this happen? Why does this happen? So let's just get rid, just get in real quick, and then and then we'll 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 try to look at both of these chapters. And I'm. Right, and I'm going to look at chapter 12, and you're going to see it up here in chapter 13. Let me just start reading. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon uh, under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Now that just takes us back, just so you can kind of get in the frame. This is a description of, it takes us back to Genesis chapter, what, 37, to where Joseph, you remember Joseph had a dream, and in that dream, Joseph, and you're wondering, okay, who is Joseph? Well, he's one of the 12 sons of, uh, uh, of Jacob who had 12 boys that became the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph was their brother, and Joseph had a dream, and Joseph said, in this dream, I saw uh, a, a, a sheave, like a sheath of wheat was lifted up, and then there were, then there were 12 sheaths over here, and these sheaths over here bowed down to this sheath and worshiped and honored this sheath. And then he said, and, and I, saw, I saw the sun and the moon and the stars. And then this, was, this sun was lifted up and the moon, sun and the moon and the stars bowed down and worshiped this star. And then he said, and this one that was lifted up was me. And, this was all, and these others were you. And, of course, his dad, Jacob, said, Are you crazy, boy? I'm never going to bow down to you. And his mom was the moon, and then his sons, his brothers, were that. And you remember, they got mad. They sold him to the Midianites and threw him in. And then he got delivered to Egypt, and he became the second in command of Egypt. And he saved the, the Egyptian people and Israel from starvation during the plague, during the seven-year drought because he determined the dream of the seven fat cows and seven skinny cows, and Pharaoh put him second in command, and his brothers had to come to him, and they didn't recognize him, and he finally revealed himself. I know I'm covering a lot, and it sounds ridiculous. But the point is, that's what that's talking about. That's what that verse means right there. It's saying, you remember that dream about the stars and the sun and the moon giving, bowing down? Well, this one, this great sign appeared in heaven, and it was a woman clothed like that. And it's, so it's literally telling you the woman is the nation of Israel. You might wonder, who is that? Well, the woman is the nation of Israel. Then, then being with child, verse 2, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. So this is obviously a sign. And when you see the word, this is a sign, it's saying, okay, this symbolizes something. So we're not, we're not looking at, okay, one of these days there's going to be a literal dragon that has ten heads and seven horns and some crowns on his head flying around in the air trying to eat up something, you know, that gets birthed out. This is a sign. This is a symbol. This is, 
This is symbolic of something that's going to happen. And, of course, in a few verses down, it's going to tell us that this dragon is the devil, the serpent, the Satan, this old Lucifer. So there's no question as to who the dragon is because in a few verses down, he's going to say it just, okay, that dragon is the devil and so forth. So right now, he says, all right, Israel is going to give birth to something that this dragon wants to eliminate off of the earth, that Satan wants to eliminate off the earth. And what he's talking about is the birth of Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about. Israel is going to be the mother who births out a child that's going to stand on the head of Satan and crush him. And so even when he's born, Satan is going to stand there with his mouth open when this one's born to try to eat him up before he can even grow up to be a man. So, so basically, John is saying in, a, in 90 AD, this is what's going to happen. You know, this is what has happened. And Satan tried to stop him from being born, but uh, he couldn't stop him from being born. So Satan tried as hard as he could to stop him from being born and eat him up when he was born. You remember Herod tried to kill all the babies and didn't get away. I mean, they, the devil did everything he could to kill him while he was still a baby, but he couldn't do it in spite of the fact that Satan did everything. The baby was born. He couldn't stop Jesus. Look at it. Ver yeah, go, Bill. Satan doesn't have any control over any of them. Mm -mm. No, he doesn't. And he's not only... He not only couldn't stop him from being born, he can't stop him from accomplishing his purpose either. Look at, look at this. Look at this. Verse, verse 2. And being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Oh, nothing's ever been as persecuted as Israel. Nothing's never, ever been uh, persecuted as long as Israel has been persecuted. From the time they've become a nation, they've been persecuted. And another sign, verse 3, appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns. Not kingly crowns, but uh, Olympic crowns. So these are not kings. These are people who... Try to be kings on his heads. I think I'm going to ask you about that too. Right. The, like in Olympic, uh, right. They have a band on and have a right. So that would that be the same of a victory that It would. It would. Right. It, you know, that, and that's exactly the kind of crown that we're talking about. Uh, the word that is used here is a word for that type of crown, not diadem. When In Revelation, when you see Jesus with the crown on, and you'll see it in these next few chapters where Jesus comes back as King of kings and Lord of lords, and in the first chapter when he saw Jesus riding in on the white horse with the crown, it's the word diadem, the crown of a king, distinctly different. So this is a fake one. This is one that's imitating Jesus which is what the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to be a cheap imitation of the real thing, trying to deceive and be deceptive. And everything that happens with the Antichrist is an attempt to deceive the people of the earth and the Jewish nation into believing that he's their Messiah. So think this. Every time you see this dragon do something, and every time you see these uh, uh, seven heads and ten horns and these, all this, it is a cheap imitation of the real thing. It's, a, it's Satan trying to imitate and copy what Jesus did. The death, burial, resurrection, the coming back to life, the wound that killed him and then he resurrected. I mean, this is just uh, uh, Satan's attempt to imitate what Jesus really did and to convince the world that he's the Messiah. Okay, so let's just go on. And uh, these seven heads and these ten horns and these seven crowns, uh, these are world powers in these last days. They're, go they're going to come a day when there are going to be seven major powers on this earth. And these are basically uh, uh, states that are alive on the earth right now. And you know, we could guess at who they are. I mean, they're nations like Turkey and they're nations like Russia, the lower part of Russia. Uh, they're uh, the Arab states, Saudi Arabia. They're Egypt. They're Libya. They're, I mean, they're, they're seven powerful nations. And we could guess at it, but we don't know how, the, how this world is going to be set up 
at, in these days, but it's just telling us that the world is going to be set up so that there's seven uh, spots of land somewhere where, that are going to rule the world. And from these seven spots of land, there are going to be ten leaders, ten kings that are going to be, that are going to have crowns on their head, but they're not going to be kings over real kingdoms. They're going to be, they're going to be fake. They're going to be imitators. And these ten kings are going to wear, wear crowns on their head, so they're going to, they're going to seem like they're in control, and they're going to be, they're going to be uh, worshipped. They're going to be looked at as kings. And we don't know how the world's going to be aligned, but it's just saying that that's the way it's going to be in those last days. And they're going to, they're going to tr come against this, this bir the birth of this, of this baby being born. And verse 4 said, His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And what this is saying to us is, all right, the way things happened was that, um, that Satan, when he rebelled against God, when you remember the story in Isaiah 14, you know, you're familiar with this, when, uh, when it tells us how Lucifer rebelled against God, and Lucifer was an angel that was a, a praise leader in heaven, and he was beautiful, and he had a beautiful voice, and his job was to lead praise and worship to Jesus and the Father and the Spirit, and pride was found in him. And he tr lifted himself up and said, I'm going to be exalted above the throne of heaven. I'm going to be worshiped like God is. I'm going to be greater than God. And, blah. and, and the Bible makes it clear that, that God said, you're out of here, boom, and kicked him out. Into the, into the air, <laughs> basically kicked him out of heaven into the air where the Bible describes him right now as the prince of the power of the air and spiritual wickedness in high places. So he has control and domination in, in the high places and so forth. And, uh, and, and so that's his abode. And he drew a third of the angels. He, a third of the angels rebelled with him. And so here we go. He drew, a, he drew the third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And then verse 5, and then she, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. That's a description of Jesus. And her child was caught up to God. And his throne, you remember, Jesus, he couldn't stop Jesus from accomplishing his purpose. Jesus came, so he couldn't stop him from being born, and he couldn't stop him from accomplishing his purpose. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. 1,260 days is three and a half years. So what John is seeing is, John is seeing, okay, in these last days, this enemy who tried to devour the child when it was born but couldn't keep the child from being born and then couldn't stop the child from accomplishing its purpose and going back to heaven in these last days, it's going to try to kill the woman and the woman is going to be able to flee into the wilderness to a place that's prepared for her God's going to prepare a place that she can be safe. Some people speculate the city of Petra, which is a fortress that Israel has used before. Now, whether it's Petra or not, I don't know. But it's going to be someplace, and they're going to be protected for three and a half years. 1,260 days is three and a half years. And so for the last three and a half years of tribulation, when the Antichrist exposes himself or who he really is and becomes ten times worse than Hitler and tries to kill him and mutilate him after he has offered this sacrifice, this, this uh, abomination of desolation, and they go, oh, my God, and they run for the hills. They're going to run for a place that God has prepared for them, that God has set up, yeah, that they're going to be able to hide, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, and, and so I don't know where that is. I, I have no idea, but God's going to have it prepared. And it's probably going to be Gentile world powers that prepare it for them. Now, whether that'll be us, most likely it would be. 
uh, or, or other Gentile world powers like, like England or, or France or Germany or any of the other Gentiles of the world are going to help prepare this. And, uh, and God's going God's to keep them safe for three and a half years. If he doesn't, they're going to be wiped off the face of the earth. Verse 15, let me get that up there. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Now, just so you'll, this is just an observation, but is that coming up? Yeah, I was just like, okay. I was wondering, is that coming up? Um, this verse right here and, and other verses like this, uh, you might wonder, okay, is this symbolic or is this literal? Like, is there really going to be like a flood, like water that really appears on the earth, like the flood of old, like Noah's flood, and it just it starts moving and chasing the Jews, and then all of a sudden the earth opens its mouth and the water goes down in the earth. Well, I'm thinking now, of course, it could be. And, you know, this is a bizarre time. This is strange happenings. But I, I'm just thinking because every other thing that is described here is symbolic. You know, I mean, the, ra the dragon, it's not like a real dragon's flying in the sky and trying to eat up something that some woman that is in heaven is trying to birth out. This is symbolic. Remember, he said, a sign. I saw a sign in heaven. I've, I saw something that represents something else. And this is what I saw, the old dragon flying around and then the woman trying to birth and then the, the dragon's trying to eat up the woman and then the dragon had a tail and he drew a third of the stars and they were cast down to the earth and then the old dragon tried to stop the baby from being born and then the dragon tried to eat him up and then God protected them and then they started running away and God had a place prepared. And all of that is symbolic. I'm thinking this is probably symbolic also. And this could be a symbol for uh, mass uh, uh, criticism and mass uh, uh, lie and mass deception. I mean, like we were talking about now. You know, when the, when the media of the world wants to make you look evil, they just do it. They, they, they start broadcasting everything. They start saying, I mean, they give the world the perspective that these people that are being chased everywhere deserve it. These people are evil. These people are wicked. These people are deserve all of the, all of the persecution and death. They deserve everything. So I'm just saying that the waters that are like a flood could be a mass campaign of propaganda against these people, and God and the earth opens up and lets and, and takes that away and protects them from being destroyed on the earth because if somebody doesn't protect them, they're going to be destroyed. They have nowhere to hide. They have nowhere to go. So miraculously, God has to open up the earth and the earth has to help them by basically sucking in this flood. You know, this is symbolic. Uh, but, you know, whether it's literal or symbolic would be something we'll be watching from the grandstands to see. But I'm just thinking because everything else is symbolic here, this is most likely symbolic it's probably not a real water but could be just keep in mind god can do anything but the earth helped the woman verse 16 and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon spewed out of his mouth so that's the woman and then we have the war and then verse 7 let me just look here. All right, verse 16, verse 17, 18, and 19 should, should say, And war broke out in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out. Who is that great dragon? Well, here he is, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceived the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, uh-oh, a worship service starts in heaven. Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Now let me just stop there and kind of give you a general oversight of what's going on. What happens here in, in, in heaven 
You know, there was an, an initial rebellion against God that Isaiah 14 describes. Isaiah says that Lucifer tried to exalt himself above God, tried to get everybody to worship him, and one-third of the angels followed with him, and God, poof, cast them out of heaven. Well, they became the prince of the power of the air. They became wickedness in high places. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness, where? In high places. So they, began, they were given dominion over, over the prince of the power of the air. Well, Satan still had access into heaven. And I know this sounds weird, but this verse tells us that in this war, that there's another war in heaven, and this is it. And, and this time, Satan loses his authority to come into the presence of God and accuse the people of God before the throne night and day. You've heard me mention this to you before, that Satan is a created being, right? I mean, he's an angel. He was an angel, and God created him. So that means he has limitations. And the limitations of created beings are that they cannot be two places at one time. Only God can be more than one place at one time because he is omnipresent. He is always present. He is present everywhere. Lucifer is not omnipresent. Lucifer is a created being that can only be one place at one time. So this verse says, where is he? He's in heaven, and he's standing before the throne of God. So if he's standing before the throne of God day and night accusing us, he can't be on the earth because he can't be more than one place at a time. So right now, God has given him access to heaven. This means, and you say, good night, is this crazy or what? Well, read the book of Job. What happens in the book of Job? The sons of God are called before the throne of God, and Satan is with them. And Satan says something, and God says, well, have you considered my servant Job? And he said, yeah, I have, but I can't do anything to him because you put a hedge around him. Now, what, where is that happening? That's in heaven. So that says Satan has access to the throne of God. So right now, Satan has given, been given authority to come into heaven and stand up in heaven and start, and start persecuting and proclaiming all of the evils and ills and broadcasting everybody's sin and everybody's failure and criticizing them and condemning them and, and bringing assault against their character and their life and, and who they are. And so heaven is kind of filled a little bit right now with uh, uh, accusation and condemnation and, and assault against the character. But there's coming a day when when when. Lucifer is going to try to take over again and Michael and his angels are going to war against Lucifer and his angels and defeat them and kick them out of heaven for the final time and they're not going to have access anymore and they're going to be delivered down to the earth. They get kicked out of heaven. You know, before, they, this is just a series of downward movements for the devil, by the way, just so you'll know that he's kicked. Originally, he was kicked out of heaven into the air. He's the prince of the power of the air. Now he gets kicked out of the air down to the earth. Then he's going to, and we're going to read in these chapters to come, get kicked down from the earth down to the abyss for a thousand years. He's going to be down in hell. And then at the end, he's going to be kicked down from the abyss into the lake of fire where he'll live forever and ever. He'll be destroyed and killed. And, well, he, you know, he's not annihilated, but he's tortured and punished for the rest of eternity in a lake of fire, what the Bible teaches. So he, everything that happens to him, he just goes down, 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 down. Well, the first step is this right here, where in the, in the, in the second half of tribulation, the devil tries to make a, a, an assault against the kingdom of God and Michael and his angels war against him, and boom, uh, they do not prevail. I like verse 8. Let me go back to it. Look at what it says. Did it come back up there on the screen? 
Yeah, here it is. Verse 8, but they did not. All right, uh, verse 7, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So that says, okay, they were kicked out. God got rid of them, and they tried to fight. And so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil. And Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then a worship service breaks out in heaven. When the devil is thrown out for the last time, all of a sudden, heaven becomes a joyous place again because now the devil has no access into the presence of God any longer. I know this sounds weird, but that's what it's saying here. And, and so now think about it. Why does heaven rejoice? Because no longer are words of condemnation heard in heaven. No longer is somebody standing before God accusing God of all of the wickedness, the evil, and the failures of everybody watching me and everybody sitting in here. And so what happens is, man, heaven gets so happy, it starts a praise service and rejoicing starts in heaven. Yeah, Rick? I read the devil ends up in hell being tormented forever along with all his demon buddies. Right. It is. Torture the devil and his demons. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, there's a, you know, a lot of people think, well, hell's, hell's the place that was made for bad people. Mm -mm. No. There's no reason that any human being ever had to end up there. That is right. what the place was designed and built right. for. It was designed to torment the devil and his demons. Right. That's exactly well, I mean, right. There's a lot of people that are going to end up there. Right. But nobody had to. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, Right, and, and let me just kind of summarize that real quick because people on, on, that are watching can't hear except through this. So, uh, but I'm just going to summarize what you were saying so they'll know what you were saying, that hell was not designed for people. Hell was a is a designed for Satan and his angels. The fact that people go to hell it are, it is a matter of their own choice. Hell was not, remember, now just kind of so you can keep in mind, remember sin did not start on the earth. Sin started in heaven when Lucifer rebelled against God and said, I'm going to lift my throne above God and I'm going to be greater than God and they're going to work. That happened in heaven. That didn't happen on earth. And so sin started in heaven and Lucifer was cast down and became the prince of the power of the air and had access to earth and access to the throne of God. That's why, now, I mean, this is just my speculation, but, but that's why when Jesus at the end cleanses all things, he has to create a new heaven and a new earth because Satan has violated the old heaven and violated the old earth by his presence there. And so God is going to create a brand new heaven and a brand new earth that will not be defiled by anything that Lucifer ever did. And so here he is now being given his final kick out of heaven. He no longer at this point will have access to the, to the heavens to go into the presence of God and accuse us day and night. And heaven has a praise party. And notice then I heard verse 10. I heard with a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them day, who, who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. Look at verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and that they did not love their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. So, all right, here's what's happening. When the devil gets kicked out for his last time, uh, there's rejoicing and, pre and, and worship in heaven because heaven now says the devil's not going to have access. So instead of condemnation and uh, criticism being heard in heaven. Now, 
only the saints will be heard and the saints start praising God for how they've been redeemed and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. And how did we live, bless God, by the word of their testimony. There's going to be testimonies flying all over heaven. And then their courage is going to be exalted. And, 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 we, and this happened because we tried to live for God even though we knew we were going to be killed. And we overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony because we, we loved God more than we loved our own life and we gave ourselves as sacrifices to him. That's what's going to be heard in heaven. And, and, and so we can rejoice, and heaven is happy, and heaven is great. But, uh-oh, woe to you guys down there. Because that old dragon has been cast down there, and he's madder than a hornet. He is stirred up because now he knows his time is limited. And so happiness up here poof, means woe to you down there because he's going to be meaner than ever, more intense than ever because he knows that he now has a short time. See, the devil ultimately knows what's going to happen to him, but he's fighting and trying in every way possible for that not to happen. And he somehow is convinced that he can win, but he can't win. He's not going to win. And this has been written down from the time of creation through now. All the words of prophecy those happened thousands of years ago, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, Christ is born for 2,000 years. The words of Jesus, the words of Paul, the words of Peter, the words of the apostle, the words of John in this book. Since 90 AD, it is 2018. And whenever this happens, at whatever date in the future he can't win. It's already been written down. He's a loser. And so woes begin to happen on earth. Now, if you want to correlate this with a time, all right, think the, the seals are broken, the trumpets sound. The fifth trumpet is a star falling from heaven to the earth with the keys to the abyss, and he opens the abyss, and out come a bunch of demon locusts. So you could... And the, and the fifth trumpet starts the first woe. I'll, I'll call your attention back to the fact that in, when the trumpets start blowing, four of them blow, and then all of a sudden this angel flies across heaven saying, Whoa! 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 Three times unto the inhabitants of the earth for that old dragon. He's been released. So this event right here where Michael <laughs> kicks him out, they fall down to the earth, that's... That is most likely what we see in the fifth trumpet. What we're seeing now in chapters uh, 10, 11, 12, 13 is what happens behind the scenes when the trumpets are being blown on earth. The trumpets in chapter, chapter 8 and 9 are a picture of, okay, this is what it looks like on earth. And then chapter 10 is an encouragement of God to, to John. So he, he must have gotten discouraged. And he must have gotten down. In chapter 10, God takes him up to heaven and says, Okay, brother, come up here. Let me get you a little refreshment. Let me get you a little worship. Let me. And then he last verse of chapter 10, remember, he says, Now you've got to go back and you've got to tell them and you've got to keep prophesying so you can't quit. Come on now, man, I got you. And, uh, and then chapters 11, 12, 13, uh, this, these are views from heaven, what's happening in heaven. While the trumpets are happening on earth, this is what's happening in heaven. And so the first woe trumpet is the trumpet in trumpet five. Trumpet five, boop, the star falls from heaven and opens the abyss and these demon locusts come out. Chapter uh, the tr sixth trumpet is when World War III breaks out on earth. And the seventh trumpet is when uh, the bowls are going to start being poured out, which are the vials, the wrath of God, which hasn't happened yet in the book of Revelation. It is going to happen on the, when the seventh trumpet blows. It's going to start happening. But right now we're in a little parenthesis this saying, okay, while all this is happening on earth, let me tell you what's going on in heaven. So we get a glimpse of what's going on in heaven while all this catastrophic stuff is happening on earth. And the fifth trumpet is the first woe trumpet. 
The sixth trumpet is the second woe trumpet, and the seventh trumpet is the third woe trumpet. So the woe trumpets start the last three and a half years of, of tribulation called the Great Tribulation. So just so you can kind of keep that. Does that make any sense? I mean, is that? All right. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, right. That's exactly right. Rick said that these things are running concurrently just in different places, and that is exactly true. This is just showing you what's going on in heaven. While all this horrible stuff is going on earth, this is why it's happening. And so uh, uh, there's a serpent, and uh, there's the, he gets cast out, and, and, and the angels say, man, um, uh, woe to you on earth for what's going on. Uh, verse, 13, verse 13, let's see here. Let me go on back. I'm in verse 19 or 18 now. I'm sorry. I've kind of crippled that thing down. Uh, yeah, let's see here. All right, verse 17, and the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest. Of, oh, okay. I'm, I'm not quite that far along. Let me go back. And when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. What is it saying? When the dragon, when Satan got cast down to earth, what did he start doing? He started, he started persecuting Israel, the woman who gave birth to the child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle. Every, you know, there are people that look at that and think, okay, that's the United States. Because they keep wondering, where does the U.S. fit in all this stuff that's happening on the earth? Well, of course, we're all gone. So most likely our nation is our nation is gone or inept, obviously. Inept. Yeah, just inept. I mean, they're, they've lost their will. They've lost their way. I mean, I hate to say that. I, I love America, and I love our country. But in these days, we're not going to be very much. But people that want to look for something about the U.S. look to this verse like this eagle is a sign of the United States. Now, I doubt very seriously whether in 90 A.D. John saw an eagle and God knew that the eagle was going to represent the United States and he wanted us to know that, so he talked about an eagle and the eagle was us. I mean, of course God knew what was going to happen in the earth and everything and he knew the eagle would represent us. But I, I'm not thinking that that represents us. I'm thinking the fact that this just represents the fact that some Gentile nations are going to help Israel get away from this dragon who's obviously trying to eat her up the whole time and kill the male. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time. For a time, one year. For times, plural, which is two years, so we got one year plus two years is how many years? Three years and a half time, which means half a year. So how much time is that? For three and a half years from the presence of the serpent. So during the last three and a half years, when this old dragon is released and his spirit is released and he tries to kill the woman and he tries to wipe her out, God's going to take her to a safe place that's been prepared and she's going to fly away and this and God, she's going to be protected for three and a half years. Uh, so it stays consistent. You know, I mean, it's the three and a half years. Let me get to verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So the point is, the Antichrist tries to kill every believer in Christ that is still left on the earth. But try as he may, there are going to be still some people that believe. And these are going to be Jews because basically every Gentile person that is not protected by God would certainly be killed by now. And you'll see why I'm saying this because the next chapter talks about the mark of the beast and the and the, and the uh, Antichrist and the false prophet and what starts happening and you're not able to buy or sell or anything. So the point being that unless God protects you, by the time you get to this time in the tribulation, you're not going to be around to do anything. So this is talking about Jewish people because the Jewish people, God has protected and some of them have seen the light. 
Some of them have become convinced that, man, this is, there's a Messiah. There's somebody protecting us. There's some, now, it's not going to be the whole nation, obviously, but it's going to be some. And so once this dragon sees, oh, well, I can't kill her because I can't find her. I can't, she's been protected. She's off the radar screen. Somehow God has blinded him to where she is, and so he can't completely wipe out the nation of Israel. Some of them are going to be killed, but for the most part, Israel's going to survive. This is what Jesus is talking about. I, I, I'm going to quit with this, but, but, you know, everything that Jesus says in Matthew 24 and 25 is about this time on the earth. Now, I know that in those verses, if you read Matthew 24 and 25, you'll see a lot of great verses that have been used in the church to be representative of some attitude or some, uh, uh, some presence or some activity that we are to be involved in. And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, there's a very familiar passage of Scripture where Jesus says um, they're going to be a group of people that said, um, uh, blessed are you. When when it is when it's exposed that you when I was hungry you fed me, when I was naked you clothed me, when I was in prison you visited me, uh, when I was sick you 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 healed me you came and helped me, and then the people are going to look and say Lord when did we do this, and when he said when you have done it to the least of one of these my brethren you've done it unto me. Now, that's talking about this day right here. where Jesus, In Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus is talking to the Jews about the last days and what's going to happen in the last days. Now, I'm not saying that it's wrong for us to have that kind of attitude. And I'm not saying that it doesn't speak to us in the church about caring for people. And all, but I'm just saying technically... That passage belongs in this time of life because that's what it's about. Because Matthew 24 and 25 is about the Jews in the last days. And Jesus, in, in the beginning of chapter 24, Jesus sits down with his disciples because he's made the statement out on the streets of Jerusalem when he's teaching and preaching. And the disciples come to him and say, Lord, tell us when this destruction of the temple is going to happen. And then he says, and what will be the sign of your coming? And what will be the sign of the end of the world? And then Jesus starts explaining those three questions that they just asked. What's going to be the sign of the destruction of the temple? What's going to be the sign of his coming? And what's going to be the sign of the end of the world? Now remember, and this is just what I'm talking about as far as theology goes. Remember, who is, who's asking him this question? Jews. He's a Jew. They're Jews. What's going to tell us what's going to happen to us, the Jews? So everything Jesus says in Matthew 24 and 25 is spoken to the Jews about the Jews in answer to the question, uh, what, what's going to be a sign of your coming and what's going to be a sign of the end of the age? And then he starts out and he says, well, you're going to hear wars and rumors of war, but don't worry about that. The end is not yet. Many are going to come in my name and they're going to deceive the very elect if they could, but don't trust them and don't believe them. And this is just the beginning of sorrows. And then he goes on to describe, and blessed is he that endures to the end for, he sh for they shall be saved. That has nothing to do with the church. That's not saying if you're saved, you need to hold on to the end or you're not saved anymore. It's talking to the Jews. If you're alive when Christ comes, you're going to be blessed because you're going to see him and then you're going to be convinced he's Messiah and you're going to come to him and, man, you're going to be saved. But it's not going to happen to everybody. It's going to happen to those who are alive. And so pray that your flight be not in the winter or on the Sabbath day. What does that mean? It means the Sabbath day, there are laws to the Jews that says you can only walk a mile on the Sabbath day. So Jesus said, I pray that your flight, your run away from the Antichrist is not on the Sabbath day because you can't run very far on the Sabbath day. 
And I pray it's not in the wintertime because it's going to be freezing cold. And I pray, and, and it said also pray that you're not pregnant with child because it's going to be hard to run away when you're pregnant because you're going to have to run for your lives, baby. See, all that stuff is written to Jewish people about what's going to be the sign, what are you going to do? And then in 25, he just keeps on explaining, and that's where that passage about feeding him and clothing him and being in jail and being naked and blah. It's written to the Jews about the Jews in the final days. So just technically, I'm just saying to you that when you think about these things, uh, you can apply the concept to, the, to us, which there's nothing wrong with applying the concept because all of the Word of God is written to instruct and reprove and correct and give us what Christianity is supposed to be about. But technically, if you want to locate something, technically that's located right here. Because some people are going to have to feed them or they're, or they're going to die. Some people are going to have to clothe them or they're not going to be able to be clothed. Some people are going to have to go visit them in prison. They're going to have to try to spring them out of jail. They're going to have to, when they're sick, they're going to have to take a medicine because in chapter, in chapter 13, there's going to come a mark of the beast that's on your forehead and on the back of your hand. And if you don't have that mark, you out of business. You can't buy, sell, I don't care if you're a multi-billionaire corporation or if you're a little kid at a snowball stand buying to try to buy a snowball. No mark, no sale. And so somebody is going to have to take care of everybody that doesn't have a mark, right? That's how they got to be. I mean, who's going to do it? Well, somebody's going to do it, and God says you're going to be blessed because of that. And he said, when you've done it under the least of one of these, my brothers, you've done it unto me. That's what that's really all about. But anyway, all right. Well, have I, has that been totally confusing? or Does that matter? Okay, Lawrence. All right. Uh, God told a bunch of people to go and kill him. Go there, kill everything. Mm -hmm. Don't leave nothing mm -hmm. to the law. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he didn't obey. Yeah, that was Saul. That was King Saul. Yeah, that's exactly right. Give you a word, what Lawrence just said for anybody that might be listening. He said there's a place in Scripture where God told uh, someone in the Bible to go kill everybody there and don't leave one. Don't bring the animals. Don't do anything. Well, what he's talking about is King Saul. You remember Saul was the king of Israel, and God told Saul, go to the Amorites, go these heathen reprobates, which are, by the way, the Arabs. He said, go kill them, everybody. Kill every woman, child, baby, cat, dog, cow, everything. Not, not one thing shall you bring back with you. And Saul went, and Saul brought the king, Agag, back, chained to the tire of the little chariot, humiliating him, uh, showing the people how great Saul was. That's pride that did it. And he dragged old King Agag back, and King Agag was chained to the chariot, and he was humiliated, and he was disgraced and dishonored. And Saul said, look how big a man I am, and I'm wonderful. And, I, and there's old sorry raggedy king of, you know, the Amorites. And this is, I'm the mighty destroyer, and whoo, everybody worship me. I mean, that's Saul's attitude. And he brought back some cows and some sheep. And, and Nathan, I mean, and Samuel, the prophet, who gave him the word of God, said, Saul, have you done everything God said to do? And Saul said, I have. And then Samuel says, well, what does the lowing of the cows and the bleeding, what is this bleeding of the sheep I hear? And, and, and at that point, Samuel said, you're finished. That's the end of you. And guess what happened? Now, this is ironic here. Guess how Saul died and Jonathan, his son, who's going to take over the kingdom. It says, by chance, an aimless, nameless arrowman let an arrow fly. And, about, and it flew through the air, and the only place that Saul's armor was weak, that arrow hit right in the crease of where that armor was weak, right at the exact location and penetrated it and killed Saul. And guess and, and, and Jonathan was right beside him, and an arrow killed him just the same way. Both of them died on the same day. Guess who shot the arrow? The descendants of Agag. Ironic, really? Yeah. 
Exactly right. That's what Lawrence was talking about. And see, and the point is, if Saul had been obedient to God, there wouldn't be any Arabs on the earth now because they would have all been dead. But yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That's exactly fine. Mm -hmm. See, that's why I'm saying that there's always been war there. There's always been tension, always been strife, always been one side trying to kill and totally wipe out and annihilate the other side. And what Revelation is saying, guess what? That's going to happen until the end. I mean, I don't care what you try to do. I don't care what the U.N. does. I don't care what President Trump does. I don't care what President Obama did. I don't care what the, any future president's going to do. I don't care what any negotiator's going to do. That stuff is going to still be happening until Jesus comes. And so try as you will. I mean, I'm not saying we ought not try, but, I mean, it's going to be it's futile. I mean, it ain't happening. I can guarantee you it's not going to happen. It's not going to solve anything. I mean, how? I mean, think about it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm quitting, but think about it. How are you going to reconcile? Now, think about this. This side hates this side. This side wants to kill this side. This side wants to kill this side. How, where, where's the compromise? How, how can you bring, what, what would be, what would be uh, a, a compromise to bring these people together? Okay, let's kill half of these. Okay, let's kill half of these. Is that going to be good enough? No, they want complete destruction of each other. So there's no compromise. There's no way to have a, a treaty of any kind or any negotiation because there's no place to go to that would be acceptable to both sides. It's ridiculous. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I mean, no, yeah, they're, yeah, that's just the spirit of Antichrist. It's the spirit of the prince of the power of the air that motivates that hatred and that, and that nature to, to be violently hatred and to be prejudiced like that, to be totally out of control just because somebody's a certain nationality. And the same thing is true no matter, I mean, no matter what kind of prejudice you have in your heart, no matter what you think you are, you are full of the devil is all it boils down to. Whether you hate black people because they're black or white people because they're white or Jewish people because they're Jewish or Irish people because they're Irish or Catholic people because they're Catholic or Protestant people because they're Protestant, Whatever kind of hatred drives that type of prejudice is devil, is demon, is delusional. And that's what Revelation is telling us. It's telling us, okay, who's behind this? That red dragon flying around heaven, <laughs> that soaker, that's right. The bottom line, the first verse I ever learned to say was John 3, 16. Yeah. For God so loved the world. God hates sin. Right. Right. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's, that's why that verse is necessary, you know, because we've all come short of the glory of God. What, what were you going to say, Jackie? Let's finish him up. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, and when we use the term and you're talking about, I'm just talking for them. Uh, Jackie was talking about people being criminally insane and being judged criminally insane. And uh, I'm, I'm just saying really that criminally insane means demonically inspired. Uh, uh, we have mental illness on this earth that is totally whack. Well, where does it come from? It comes from the, the evil one, the prince of demonic influence it becomes it's strongholds that are set up in minds it's uh, principalities and wickedness what does it say in ephesians for we wrestle not against flesh and blood we shouldn't even hate yeah right i mean we should hate no one because no one i mean look uh black people are not our enemy white people are not our enemy arabs are not our enemy irish are not our enemy catholics Aren't our, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But look, look, all of this stuff is happening. It's because flesh and blood hates flesh and blood. When the Bible says our enemy is not flesh and blood, 
It's principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And it says, therefore, put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So, yeah, you're getting it. You're getting the attitude. And what, that's what the book of Revelation is about right now. It's about where does that come from, where is it going, and what's going to happen. And it, it's just starting now. So chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, oh, it gets real gone. It goes, it goes way into some detail. And so if you're interested in that, Come on back. If you're not, I'll be here by myself. Maybe a few. Maybe a few in, in there. Can you hang is what I'm going to say. Can you hang? You thought you were interested in Revelation. Now, are you really? Uh, it's really, it's all about these things. Okay. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, you came with a couple of nuggets. Thank you, brother. That's so kind. That's something. Well, I appreciate that very much, you guys, and you know, uh, how much that really helps. And, if you know, if you can come away with a few things that might help you to, to get a grip on everything, I mean, God wants you to understand. Uh, the Scripture says all Scripture is about given by inspiration of God, and it's useful for instruction and correction and righteousness that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. God wants you to be prepared. He wants you to understand. He wants you to know what's going on. And even though we, we can know all of this, all that does is just increase our faith to know God is in control. There is a plan. God knows what's happening. This is how it's going to happen. So don't be afraid and know that God has a purpose and he's in control. And this is what's going to happen. And our job is to be vigilant, to be instructive, to be leading people to righteousness as much as possible uh, in these days that we have on this earth. But anyway, okay. All right. Let's